and welcome to this online program of the American Writers Museum. My name is Allison Sansoni and I'm the program director for the AWM. We'll give everyone a few minutes to file into the room here and go over some housekeeping notes before welcoming our participant. Our book selling partner, both here and in person, is Seminary Co-op Bookstore. I'm going to be posting a link to the author's book throughout the event in the uh, on the screen, so please keep an eye on that, and we'll post another link at the program's end. If you like the kinds of programs you see here and you want to receive advance notice of new exhibits and initiatives, discounted tickets to special events, including our new series of happy hours, Get Lit, you can join us as a member at AmericanWritersMuseum.org. This interview has been pre-recorded. However, if you have a question for today's speaker, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen while this, you're watching this broadcast. We'll pass those questions along to our guest and post as many answers as we can on our blog at a later date. Thank you all for being here and supporting the past, present, and future of American writing. We're here today to discuss Tough Guy, Dr. Richard Bradford's new biography of Norman Mailer. The icon of the 20th century's new journalism and the author of The Executioner's Song and the Armies of the Night provides a subject as complicated as any he ever wrote about. Violent, overbearing, and as Bradford puts it early in the book, grotesque and addictive. Dr. Bradford is research professor in English at Ulster University and visiting professor at the University of Avignon, France. He has published over 30 widely acclaimed books, including biographies of Philip Larkin, Kingsley Amos, George Orwell, and many others. He is joining us today from Avignon. Welcome, Dr. Bradford. No, oh, you're fine. Uh, we were talking a little bit about the the um, the uh, uh, similarities and differences between his work and Hemingway's, yeah. who he idolized. Yeah, in in the sense that Hem Hem Hemingway's. Uh, novel about novels about his 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 first world war experience and his spanish civil war experience you can see how mailer was not necessarily influenced by it he didn't try to copy him but he saw this as um he saw this as part of mailer's uh persona it, people believed everything that he said this so this is part of Hemingway's persona people believed everything Hemingway said in the novels as autobiography. Autobiography. So um, th there was an it, an area of influence there with the naked and the dead. Certainly, later I don't think there were many parallels at all, other than the the circumstances of what Mailer thought his his life was like. You know, the drinking yeah. and the brawling and the women yeah. and and yeah. that yeah. sort of yeah. thing. It's. Yeah. But uh, irrespective of his admiration for Hemingway, I don't think he deliberately copied him in terms of his lifestyle. It would have turned out like that anyway. Yeah. Yeah. You you focus a great deal early on in the book on on Mailer's relationship with his, you know, with the first of his of his spouses, the first se first and second of his spouses and later go on, you know, the the numerous conquests and the violence of many of his relationships. And I was struck by the way that it didn't seem to harm his reputation at the time. His reputation with whom and among whom? Among, among the literary elite. It, it didn't stop him from winning a Pulitzer uh, Prize. It didn't stop him from disqualify him from awards the way that perhaps it might no, have. Yeah. But I, I, I suppose that reflects um, the um the way in which women were treated generally during that period in the decades after world war ii the fact that he did behave badly towards women didn't matter too much in a largely male dominated literary culture um and i mean <laughs> it's astonishing that although he married six times he was married for virtually all of his life in the sense that I tried to work it out on one occasion. I think he was only actually unmarried for his entire life for something like six weeks. In that it was largely the case that the woman with whom he was having a uh, fairly long-term relationship, that would end uh, each of the marriages. 
But as soon as the divorce was completed uh, for the previous marriage, he would marry the woman with whom he was having an affair. So he was very, very rarely unmarried. So uh, apart from being a serial um, Lothario, in that he was having other relationships as well, he appeared to be a serial monogamist in that he couldn't stop marrying women. He didn't just want to have affairs. He wanted to have affairs, but he also wanted to be married to one woman for as long as he could keep it up. That is, keep up the appearance of being faithful to that woman. And he usually failed because he was pretty terrible about covering things up. Um, yeah, at, the, at the same time that he was, I was struck by that, that at the same time that he was, you know, telling that he was having affairs and he was proud of that. He was proud of his prowess with, with women. He was also very invested in this image of himself as a good married man. And I, yeah. I found that interesting that he could hold both those ideas in his head at the same time. Yeah, he, he, he held certain, um, I, I, I suppose he clung to certain ideal, ideals that you more of, often associate with the 19th century in that he didn't really believe in contraception. Because, I mean, <laughs> it, it wasn't for, for religious reasons. He thought he be, he saw he saw sex as part of his procreational force, if you like, and something was lost if he if he or whichever woman he was having an affair with or was married to used uh, used contraception. It wasn't really sex, so it was quite bizarre. Um, and. He was he his his mor morality was a sort of twisted version of puritanical morality. He he had sex with every everyone he wanted to, but according to his own rather strange, surreal, peculiar ideals, if you wish to call them that. The the idea it wasn't just the women that he that that he was involved with that he fought with. He you know he sort of perfected the idea of the the literary feud. And, and I'm wondering how much of that was genuine animosity for certain people and how much of that was careerism? Was he trying to get attention for himself and his work by fighting with these other writers? I think it was a bit of both um, because as his reputation spread as um, a man who, if offended, either in terms of um, by someone who was a literary rival or, or who had reviewed his work unfairly as he saw it or just um by people he saw as potentially a sort of threat to him at, at, at a party he might headbutt them or punch them or whatever but it became habitual and addictive and people put up with it uh, you know this is norman mailer you could expect him to punch someone if you invite him to a party and the one that was I suppose everyone knows about, but it was almost hilarious if um, you want to see it in that way, was his, his long-term feud with um, Gore Vidal. Yeah. And the famous event, of course, at the Dick Cavett show. But there was the audience in the studio and the live TV audience who didn't really understand the subtext of this because um, at one point he stood up after you know all day drinking whiskey and taking drugs, and accused um, Vidal of murdering Jack Kerouac, and the audience apparently stared at one another in complete puzzlement because Kerouac had uh, died something like two years earlier. Um, of, I mean, he virtually drank himself to death. He said, "How could he have murdered Jack Kerouac?" And this this was a private story that went back uh, over a decade because. Um, Mailer had been driving Vidal back from some party, some social event, probably in Provincetown, I think, in his sports car. And um, Vidal had said to him in this insouciant way, he just made a remark about how he spent the weekend in bed with Jack Kerouac. And Mailer almost crashed the car because <laughs> apart from his slightly odd opinions on women he was almost he, at that time he was very homophobic and he thought uh homosexuality was a disease because you know sexuality 
uh, male heterosexual sexuality was a key to his slightly weird um, political ideals. And he held this against Gore Vidal for years and years afterwards. And he thought that he'd corrupted Jack Kerouac, that he turned him into a homosexual, and he, which is effectively what killed him in Mailer's view of things. Which is why one of the reasons he held so many things against Gore Vidal, apart from the fact that Gore, Gore Vidal was of a different social class and part of the literary aristocracy, and Eva, Eva, Mailer felt that he was outside that. So in the end, he ended up headbutting him at the show on television. And then the famous riposte by Gore Vidal, once again, Norman, words fail you. He, he had a way with a sentence. Yeah. 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 His his writing at that at the you know at the at the time I you know I was reading the rereading the portions of of um, that you included in your book about his work with the Village Voice and and some of the yeah. other you know sort of quasi political writing that he was doing at that period in history it it seemed sh designed to shock and outrage and there were critics who f and scholars who find virtue in, in that and I. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but I didn't get the sense that you were one of them. That you did no, not. I, I thought. I, I thought. I mean, it, it wasn't just some of the stuff he wrote for Village Voice seemed to be deliberately designed to as, offend as many people as possible. Um, again, because he was a showman, he wanted to draw attention to himself. I mean, he let his own political ideals, if you can um, promote them as such, were intellectually lazy to say the least in that he wrote a couple of essays um shortly after the naked and the dead uh threw him into the spotlight and he had these uh, the, the first the first non-fictional piece of writing he published after the naked and the dead involved his prediction that um the soviet union would take over all of western europe and it would generally be a good thing because people would enjoy it. And this would happen in the US as well. And he had this slightly adolescent view of socialism as something that everyone would enjoy because it was generally good for you. And in truth, um, this was because it was a form of radical idealism that flattered him if he held these views. but. He never actually read any Marx at all. B, his first wife was uh, pretty well up on these matters, and she told him things that he pretended to have uh, read, but he he hadn't read them. She educated him in many ways on in these uh, ideas and theories, but he messed them up. I mean, uh, the 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 one, of course, famous piece of nonfiction that he worked, he wrote, he produced during this period um, when he was writing Village Voice was of course the white negro which is one of the most bizarre pieces of non-fiction i've ever come across um it's it's difficult to sum it up or even uh summarize the rationale for it because he seems to have put together at random everything strange that he'd ever previously written and cobble it together in one what was it, 15,000 word essay? Um, but the, the theme that reappears again and again is his view that African-Americans are at the heart of um, what will become the revolution in America, mainly because they have more sex than white men. He was that not, was the, that. that seemed like a that seemed like a very particular um, uh, theme that he would return to over and over. And it was interesting to see how the essay at the time, the reception at the time, didn't really interrogate that or criticize it in any way. No, because that, mainly because there were so few um, African Americans involved in literary culture who uh, you know had a voice there. James Baldwin was offended for life by what he found in that. But again, he was in a minority of about two or three, so he didn't really have much influence. But he did, he did push back 
on you know on Mailer's views and and did oh yeah yeah he did yeah he did but at the, yeah. at, at the time he, he was he, he was he was working um I suppose not literally but on, underground in the sense that uh no no one else or hardly anyone else saw the essay as racist and it was enormously it it, it was the sort of thing that if you stripped away the radical element um you might find being written by a um southern white supremacist if if you know if you if you remove that aspect of, oh it's it's going to be a wonderful idea because african americans will in some way inspire the revolution his presentation of african american people was um unapologetically racist but there was it, there were very very few very few people to speak out against that it relied on he was making an argument but he was relying on racist tropes to to make that argument yeah yeah i i wonder if the the literary figures and the critics who were praising Mailer's work in this period come in for some some harsh criticism in your book and i i wonder if you think they were they were motivated by a performance as well were they projecting their own um opinions onto literature as a whole and using him as a way to do that i think so because um the the for you know surrounding village voice surrounding the bohemians surrounding the largely white um radicals those who held vaguely or confusedly left-wing views at the time um it was a form of performance um and that's why he was so widely celebrated um that i mean it, ha it happened in a different form but in a way that you can see in terms of comparisons in the UK and in most Western democracies as well. Call it what you like. Uh, I think the American terms is um, Mercedes Marxist. Or in the UK, the more common term is um, my mind uh, has gone blank there. Bollinger Bolsheviks, basically, the well-known champagne um, brand. Mm. They seem to ignore the anomaly of their ideal, that most of them were pretty well off, either by their own making, because they were successful writers or artists or um, producers or um, actors, or because they'd inherited wealth. They didn't seem to realise that if... Uh, extreme socialism did arrive, their lifestyle would disappear completely. And again, it, it, it seems to me, um, I know, a, 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 key, a, a key element of this lazy intellectualism, if you like, that was common, particularly throughout the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s in particular, I mean, many, he, he, Mailer didn't visit the place, but they idealized the Soviet bloc, ignoring the fact, and the well-known facts, that it was a repressive authoritarian regime, and that any form of Marxism in practice would ruin what is generally known as freedom. But yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons why uh, Mailer was turned into a hero um, through the 50s and 60s, particularly. It's, it's difficult to imagine someone with any number of his, um, as you say, varied, let's say, political views becoming intimately involved in, in national politics today. But at the time, yeah. he became, Mailer became connected with the Kennedy campaign. Somewhat, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. somewhat intimately. How how did that how did that happen, and what how did that how did he use that in his writing? Well, it, it happened um, more or less by accident because the Kennedys um, uh, 
the, the, the Democrats had used a sort of cartoon um, version of Nixon presenting him, or rather it was a photograph of Nixon, where he was unflatteringly presenting, presented as a sort of slightly swarthy used car salesman. And the Republicans very cleverly hit back with a, a, a somewhat underground version of this, saying that, uh, OK, Nixon will sell you a car, but Kennedy will sell you a car and he will make sure that the car is in good condition. He'll come around, check it's going well, uh, and then he'll come around again, make sure you're out and then sleep with your wife. Um, and Kennedy and his uh, campaign group were anxious about this because they knew that Kennedy had a certain reputation for infidelity. And they wondered if the Republicans knew details of this that they might release to the underground press. And since Mailer was part of that set, they brought him in for an interview to check him out, to see if he knew things about Kennedy uh, that the Republicans might know as well. And when they realized that Mailer didn't really know anything at all, that he saw, he saw him as a sort of secular saint, they thought, okay, we're safe. And after two visits, one involving Mailer and his wife, they got rid of him completely. And it was, again, a, a sort of a series of comic episodes whereby he can, continuously wrote to uh, the Kennedys in the White House and he, he received no answer at all. You know, he, he hoped to be brought into the White House administration as an advisor, but they ignored him completely thereafter. And he he really became, you know, he continued to address him in print. You know, he he made Kennedy sort of the the object of his um of his essays and his writing and and yeah. he, you know, open letters and things like that as well. And so he obviously it something it lodged in his head that this was, you know, this was someone to whom he could address all of his thoughts. Yeah, um, I mean, again, again, you you can see. The, there's a sort of relationship between um, Kennedy as the um, potential savior of the U.S. And in, 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 in some ways, uh, Mailer misunderstood the Kennedy campaign. He saw it as far more radical than it turned out to be. But you can see how his own campaigns uh, for, you know, in, in New York, he saw himself as a sort of version of Kennedy. Both the first one, which came to a sudden halt when um, he almost stabbed to death his second wife, and the second one, which was taken far more seriously. And he did quite well. He gained a large number of votes. But again, I, I think he saw himself as um, something that rarely happens in the UK. A writer who, because they are a writer and an intellectual, would... Uh, fit naturally into the role of the of, of politician as well he it's you know you you mentioned before that he was a sort of mimic he would you know he'd enter a situation and become who he needed to be in that environment um in that milieu and i'm you know in politics he seemed to um, you know, he seemed to be really embodying an idea of what he thought a left-wing radical would be. And I'm wondering, did you get a sense in, in, you know, in researching him whether any of those beliefs were sincere? It was impossible to say. I think they must have been sincere in that he became the person that he wanted to be or he became the person that he wanted to um, project to other people. But uh, sincerity based upon a ill thought out fantasy is a contradiction in terms, I think. And that's mainly, that's, that's what his views were. I mean, during the second uh, New York mayoral campaign, the one that was taken seriously, and the one where he gained a large number of votes, he, he didn't seem um, to look closely or closely enough at the um, costs or potential outcome of these promises that he made 
he, he turned, as he's well known, he, you know, he, he promised to turn the city into a sort of mini metropolitan heaven where they'd be sweet Sundays with no motor vehicles and no aeroplanes and no electricity running. And, you know, people would say, but what about snow plows in the middle of winter? Are you going to abandon sweet Sundays in winter? Um, and what about machines in um, hospitals that are keeping people alive with oxygen? How are you going to keep those going if there are, there's no electricity? And he, he wanted to have the police moved into areas of high crime where they would live in flats. And because they would be treated in an avuncular manner by the gangs, all crime would be solved. And they would be the ones who would hand out methadone to drug addicts and be treated kindly by drug addicts instead of shot by drug addicts and so on and so on. He was off his head. But he still got a large number of votes. And Jim Breslin, the hard case uh, ex-docker who had fought in real campaigns and knew what living in cities was really like rather than living in, uh, you know, a half million dollar apartment. Uh, he was he was as his campaign manager and he'd be listening to Mailer making it up as he went along and, and handing out all of these promises at various meetings, some of which, uh, which uh, many of which he got rounds of applause and Breslin could be seen with his head in his hands. And he abandoned the campaign about three times and was only persuaded to come back because people said, look, we'll persuade him to stop doing this and be more sensible. <laughs> Sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, you mean most recently? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it occurred to me that, um, I, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to in, in, insult your country, but um, I don't know how, whether President Trump reads very much, but you'd think he'd be a sort of admirer of Norman Mailer in a, in a curious way, really. The, the the showmanship, the the idea of um, you know the idea of deliberately shocking <laughs> people. I I was reading this shocking, thinking Norman Mailer would be at home on a lot of cable shows right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are, I mean, okay, there are lots of differences, but you can see certain parallels. Yeah, yeah. In, he, he, I mean, Mailer was a, a sort of um, one of the first political populists. But before populism became a practical, uh, though shameful, means of gaining political power. But he, off you know, he offered people um, things that couldn't, in any common sense way, be obtained. But that's become politics in the UK and Europe, and I suppose in most democracies these days, over the past ten years, anyway. In in looking at his at his later work, especially the the Executioner song, you you touch on something else that's a that's incredibly relevant right now, which is the idea of sort of this novelization or or fic, almost fictionalization of real people and and the use of someone as a character um, who's a real person and who's who may differ from the the popular picture that's presented by this piece of work and I I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what Mailer did there um, and how uh, and what happened afterwards well I mean um although personally I I, I don't particularly enjoy that hybrid form that Mailer can claim not necessarily to have invented and uh, to have taken control of exclusively, but he was probably the most, the most influential figure in its creation, the hybrid form being, uh, I mean, it, it, I suppose the, 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 the archetype is the, arm, uh, the armies of the night, whereby he wrote, he wrote about what actually happened at the protests in, uh, before the Pentagon, the anti-Vietnam protests. And if you check, uh, shall we say, documentary facts as reported in newspapers and other media, he, he stuck pretty closely to what occurred. But at the same time, as we know, um, Norman Mailer appears in it uh, as part of this third person narrative. And although he doesn't, when I say he, the third person narrator, doesn't change events or the time scale too much, we begin to wonder about 
when we're convinced how the nuances which are borrowed from fiction are actually altering our perception of what we believe to have happened. And the same is, occurs in uh, the Executioner's song as well. He doesn't invent anyone. He sticks with real names and he sticks with the recorded time scale. But at the same time, he writes as though he's a, a novelist. He gets inside people's minds. And he can't, he, you know, he didn't, the, the people he didn't actually interview, people he didn't know even. And he takes a, he, he, he reads about the events, he sticks to the authentic facts, and then he, step, he takes a step even further, makes us feel as though we're thinking the way they're thinking. It's, it's a form of dangerous realism, if you like, because he's not telling lies in terms of altering documented facts, but he's perhaps making us see them as he wants us to see them. I, yeah, I, mean, I was, sorry, while sorry. I was reading that, no, while I was reading that chapter, I couldn't help but think about the the backlash to, you know, some of the, the shows on streaming services and the murder podcasts and things like that, that were, and particularly the, um, the way that the victims of Jeffrey Dahmer were treated in some of the um, dramatizations of the serial killer story. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I kept, I couldn't decide whether Norman Mailer would have enjoyed those types of programs and been writing one himself or whether he would have seen that as a natural sort of outgrowth of what he was doing. I, I yeah, it's, it's difficult to say. I suspect something of the latter though. Yeah, yeah. But it's, I mean, those those things had real world consequences. I mean, people were, you know, the the man who was released from prison and went on to um, to kill again. The um, and Mailer seemed very dismissive of the consequences of the, of his work. Well, yeah, I mean, the 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 case of Abbott, it's almost as though it was uh, reality taking revenge on uh, Mailer or using fiction. Uh, on real life, if you like, because when Abbott wrote to him after the executioner's song, it's it seems that Mailer thought that he'd been written to by his own version of Gilmore. You know, there's a real man who can write in a very hard but impressive manner from a prison cell. And that was his version of Gilmore. I think he attributed to Gilmore certain characteristics and qualities that may have been there, but we'll never know. And when Abbott introduced himself to him in letters, he thought, my God, this justifies what I did. But it turned out to be quite different because two weeks after Abbott was released, and Mailer, of course, had a considerable influence in the uh, decision to release him, he murdered uh, a bar manager and went on the run while he's the virtually the day after his own book was published it was yeah. almost as though gary gilmore uh had walked out of the novel and become part of norman mailer's life as i say it seemed to it seemed to be the real life taking revenge on mailer for using fiction as a way of altering reality well, and the, the justification that he made in, you know, in excusing someone because of the quality of their work, the quality of their yeah. art, it, it echoed what was done to him as well. That, you know, as you say, he's this influential figure. He's this incredibly, you know, he's he's doing these new things with with writing, with form, and shouldn't that be worth some of the the trauma that he's causing? Um. Be, be worth some of the trauma that he's that Mailer is that Mailer was causing it's the same it seemed to me to be the same argument that you know that Mailer's transgression should be excused because he's this influential literary figure yeah I, I yes I see what you mean in the uh yeah I, I I suppose that's why he continually overstepped the mark in terms of his uh actual behavior because um
it, it seemed to, I mean, the, 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 the point I make at the beginning, when I said that Mailer's life seems to me to be uh, rather like a novel, but there's, an, there's another parallel there, because if you write a novel, there are potentially um, no barriers towards, uh, against what your character can get away with. All right, it might seem rather unrealistic if you allow them to transgress so many uh, rules and conventions that you think, well, surely somebody's got to stop this. But with Norman Mailer, no one ever did. So that's why I think he, he became rather like uh, a character in a novel that he was living. Nobody stopped him at all. Even his wives, who attempted to stop him. And Norris Church, in the end, I suppose, was reasonably successful. But that came down mainly to, I suppose, the onset of uh, late middle age, when he realised that he couldn't continually get away with it. And Norris was, I suppose, um, his, his partner and his uh, helper, I think she took over where he took over from his mother in many ways. As a as a caretaker as well as yeah, his spouse. Yeah. yeah. One of the Mailer's place in the literary canon is something I, I wanted to ask you about, particularly as we, you know, we we are always considering and reconsidering whose stories are told and promoted from one generation to the next. Where do you think he stands now? And does your book make a case for that position one way or the other? That's an interesting question. Um I think when literary writers are admitted to the canon. Um, what it involves is their work becoming um, almost immune from criticism, by which I mean you can criticise them in uh, the formal context of studying them because they are um, beyond question great works of art. So you can look at them from different perspectives and uh, examine how the writer have ach had achieved this and done this and all that and all that. I, so by criticism, I don't mean evaluative criticism. I mean um, criticism in terms of uh, analysis, uh, tracing how effects, um, uh, how certain devices have certain effects and what the author may have been thinking when he achieved this and so on and so on. But in terms of greatness in terms of the work being unquestionably a, cl a classic, if you like. I think Mailer will remain um, in a canon of his own because no one will ever, I think, agree on his work being, or his works being literary greats. They will agree, I think, that his work is enormously important because we can never agree on whether it's great or not. There will always be a controversy surrounding the work of Norman Mailer, and very few writers have achieved that. They either are, they either slip into the sidelines and become so minor that, you know, they're worth only a uh, master's degree by thesis if somebody finds some of their stuff that they think, well, not enough attention has been given to this mainly because it deserves, doesn't deserve much attention. But he'll always be there because he's part of um, American history post-war, an enormously important period. And at the same time, the way in which he intersects with America, American society and the global conflicts of that era and the way in which his work is there at the same time and the way in which his work is rather like Mailer, largely unclassifiable. It goes all over the place. It does so many things at the same time. Sometimes it fails absurdly. And sometimes it is truly excellent, I think. Even if you don't necessarily enjoy it, you have to admire it for what he attempted to do. So, yeah, I think Mailer will endure as an important writer, but not in the comfortable sense of being someone like Tolstoy or Dickens, who just stuck there on the shelf as a great 
nobody will agree on whether it's a great or not. I think which, of, is, of, which is quite which is quite impressive in its curious way. I was going to say I think I think Mailer himself might enjoy that that we are uh, still like, debating well, and arguing and having a fight over him. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes, good point. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this this conversation. It's been wonderful, wonderful. and we really appreciate you taking the time to join us all the way from uh, from Avignon. Yes, I'm going back to Ireland next week, so. Well, thank you so much. I, I very much. I've, I've enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting me. Mm -hmm.